Good afternoon. Last week we started learning about Samuel, didn't we? And we learned how as a young boy, he went to live in the temple and he uh, met with the Lord and he became a Christian. And this week's lesson is later on in his life. He has become the priest, the prophet that speaks to God and, and speaks to the people from God. And he is a much older man now. You'll see in the very beginning bit of the reading that he has uh, spoken to his sons next. So he's thinking about the future. He's a very old man. He's been a fair judge to the people for all of this time because that's what the prophet was to the people of Israel. He was the judge and the prophet and the priest. Uh, there was no separate king or ruling body. Uh, God was the ruler and the priest spoke to them from God. But in today's lesson, the people have decided that they want something different. So this is 1 Samuel chapter 8. Now it came to pass when Samuel was old that he made his sons judges over Israel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, Look, you are old and your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us, like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to, ju to judge us. So Samuel prayed to the Lord. And the Lord said to Samuel, Heed the voice of the people, that means listen. Heed the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not reign over them. However, you shall solemnly forewarn them and show them the behaviour of the king who will reign over them. So Samuel told all the words of the Lord to the people who asked him for a king, and he said, this will be the behaviour of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them for his own chariots and to be his horsemen, and some will run before his chariots. He will appoint captains over his thousands and captains over his fifties, will set some to plough his ground and reap his harvest, and some to take his weapons of war and equipment for his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, cooks and bakers, and he will take the best of your fields, your vineyards and your olive groves and give them to his servants. He will take a tenth of your grain and your vintage and give it to officers and servants. And he will take your male servants, your female servants, your finest young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take a tenth of your sheep and you will be his servants. And you will cry out in that day because of your king whom you have chosen for yourselves, and the Lord will not hear you in that day. Nevertheless, the people refused to obey the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. And Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he repeated them in the hearing of the Lord. So the Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. So these are the four headings that I want to consider with you this afternoon. The people in Israel were discontented. They were unhappy with what they had. So they demanded something different. They disregarded the warning that they were given and they were delighted with getting what they wanted. So these people have settled, remember, in the land of Israel. They have their temple and their priest and their prophet who speaks to them from God. They have some of the scriptures. They have a priest, a prophet who speaks to God directly and gives them information also. But they were discontented because they didn't want God. They didn't want God to rule over them. Now, we have a queen, don't we? This country has had a king or a queen for a long time. And so we're used to having a king or a queen. And the way that they rule the country now 
is rather different to how it was before. Nowadays, we have a government, we have a prime minister, and that prime minister actually has more control than the queen does. The queen has become almost a, a figurehead. But in those days, the king was in absolute control. It wasn't a democracy. There wasn't discussion and agreement with the people. Uh, the king was a dictator. He was in charge. And that king would lead them in the battles. He would tell them what they were supposed to be doing. He would um, fight if they needed to gain land somewhere. He would be in absolute control. And the Israelites would have seen this from all the lands around them because they were the only ones that did not have a king. And they didn't like that. They didn't like being different. They didn't like that everybody else around them had someone in control and that the one that was in control of their land and their nation was not visible. They knew that God was in control. They knew that they were God's people. They knew that they were set apart, that they were deliberately different because they were God's people. But they decided that that wasn't what they wanted. They didn't want a priest as a judge. They didn't want a prophet to tell them what God said. They wanted to be just like everybody else. And so they came to Samuel and they demanded that things change. They were not troubled because troubled would suggest that something was actually wrong. They were more disgruntled, discontent. That feeling that we get when nothing's really quite right. We can't say the problem is this. We can't say this is the solution. It just doesn't feel quite right and we don't really like it. And so they said, make us a king to judge us like all the nations. We will have a king over us that we also may be like all the nations. So they may have come to Samuel talking about Samuel's sons and whether they were fit to do the job that Samuel did. But as this conversation continues through that chapter, it becomes very clear that this is about being like everybody else. I wonder how many of us like to be just like everyone else. I know that when I was a teenager, that was all I really cared about. I wanted lots of friends. I wanted to be like everyone else. And these people were just like that. All they cared about was the people around them and what they thought of them. I suppose it's an early version of peer pressure, isn't it? Wanting things to change because other people have got something that we think that we want. So as I said, they went to Samuel and they gave their demand. They didn't ask nicely. They didn't ask whether it was appropriate. They didn't pray to God about it. They demanded, we want a king. Give us a king. Now, I would say one thing here. They didn't just go and appoint their own king. So they knew that this wasn't quite appropriate. They knew that this was something that God would not agree with. They knew that they were set apart people. Because if they actually thought that this was a good thing to do, they would have just chosen the appropriate person and carried on as if nothing else mattered. But they didn't. They went to Samuel and they demanded of Samuel to give them a king. So what they've done there is they've gone to God or the spokesman for God in this case. And they've said, you're doing it wrong. We're not doing it like that anymore. We want you to do it like this instead. Isn't that a proud way to behave? They've gone to God and told God he's doing it wrong. They have suggested that they know better. We're weak, infallible humans. We don't know better than God. But they decided that they didn't like things the way they were, and so they demanded that it changed. And more than that, they demanded that someone else changed it. They weren't going to do this for themselves. They weren't going to be straightforward and just do what they wanted. 
they demanded it of God. They wanted that king so that he would help them to look like everybody else. And so that when they had battles, instead of God uh, guiding them and telling them what to do, there would be a king, a figurehead in a sense, standing out in front of them, judging, the, uh, showing them what to do, fighting the battles. And so that other people would look and say, yes, they've got a great king. They didn't want a God that no one could see. They wanted everyone to see that they had this amazing king. Now, clearly, Samuel was not very happy with this, not because Samuel thought that they should um, respect him as a person, but because of the job that he did. He was God's spokesperson. And so if they were coming and demanding this of him, it showed their attitude towards God. And so he prayed to God about it and he asked him what he should do. And God said to him, give them what they want. But before you do that, give them this warning. He will take. There's quite a few things that this king was going to take. But let's start off with just that. He will take. This king was not going to come along and give them things. What they wanted was a king that would give them respect and the pride when they looked around other people of, yeah, we're a big, strong nation. That's what they wanted. And they were warned by God that having a king would mean that things were taken from them. Now, God knew what was going to happen. He knew the consequences of this decision, as he knows everything. But what he says here doesn't apply to just the particular person that was chosen. It actually applies to any king. Because the things that they were warned about were part of that role. Yes, kings choose to behave in particular ways. And some of those will be good and some of those will be bad. But what they had failed to understand at this stage was what having a king meant. It didn't just mean other people would look up to them. And so they were being warned that this was the consequence of having a king. Firstly, he would take your sons. Now, at the moment, when they needed to go and fight, the sons that would, would go and be part of that army and they would go and they were protected by God and then they were sent home again. But a king wouldn't behave in that way. If you think about the way that we have an army, they are people that are trained. They are people that spend their whole lives, well, some of them, but certainly the whole of uh, the time that they are in the army, being ready to protect and to fight for their country. So these, the change for these people, for the sons, would be that rather than having their sons at home, ploughing in the fields and working with them, um, and then going to fight when they were needed, that they would have to be away all the time. He would also take their daughters to be his servants. Samuel didn't have servants. Samuel wasn't considered this amazing, great person because, as I said before, it was about the role that he did, not about who he was. But a king would have servants. They would have to be looked after. They would expect a certain level of luxury, wouldn't they? And their daughters would be expected to go and work for him, to be, as it says in, the, in the, what we read, his bakers and his cooks and his perfumers. They would be expected to look after him. And so again, they wouldn't have their daughters at home to work on their things, their, their baking and their cooking and their fields. He would also take the best of their fields. So currently, the fields have been fairly shared 
between the different families. But a king would expect that some of those fields would be his, and he would take good fields to give to those people that supported him and looked after him. If you think of now in England, but that there are people that are lords, aren't there? And now that's more a, a, a title that uh, seems a bit historic, doesn't it? But the reason that they had those was because they looked after particular areas of land for the king. And they would be awarded those those lands by doing something for him. Perhaps they went out and uh, won a battle for him or agreed with him in a particular case. And so they would be given these lands. And the same thing would have happened then. Their fields would be taken away so that they could be given to others. They wouldn't have the best lands. They would have simply what was left. Their possessions would also be taken. So they would be expected to give, uh, in the same way as we give taxes, they would be expected to give portions of their food that they've grown and portions of the, the animals that they've reared. And they would be expected to share those with the king because he wouldn't be expected to go and work. He would have other things to do. So they would be expected to support him. Now, all of these things happen now. All of these things are normal for a king. But what we have to try and understand here is that the Israelites weren't used to this. This was all new for them. They were being warned about what a king actually meant, what having a king would mean to their entire land. This wasn't about the pride of individual people. It wasn't just about what people would see when they looked on them. And uh, the, the last thing there is that their servants would also be taken. Anyone that worked for them could also be taken to go and work for the king. So they were given this warning. God warned them through Samuel that this is how their lives would change. And they wouldn't just change on a short term basis. This would be a long term thing. They were asking for the rule of their country to change. They were asking for everything to be different. In a sense, they were going from a more democratic way of ruling to having one person in charge. Now, it wasn't a democracy. God was in charge. But the very fact that the people were able to go and speak with Samuel shows a difference. Uh, even from what we have now, doesn't it? We can't go and speak to the queen. They wouldn't have all been able to go and speak to the king, but they could all go and speak to Samuel. And so things were going to change dramatically for them if they kept up this demand. And they did. They completely disregarded the warnings that they were given. They decided it wasn't important. The most important thing for them to, was to be just like everyone else and to have what they wanted. That might seem like a very simplistic way of saying it, but it's true of us as well, isn't it? Sometimes we turn away things that would be so good for us because it's not what we want. On a very simple level, we decide that we want to be healthier and we want to eat better, but then we see something that looks a bit more tasty and we go for that instead, don't we? We know the warnings that if we eat too many sweets, then our teeth drop out, but we like sweets and we want them. And that is very similar to what these people were doing. They were really thinking about what they wanted and not thinking about the consequences of those decisions. And even when that consequence was put in front of them, the warnings were given, they chose not to listen. And so, because they chose not to listen, they were given what they wanted. Samuel went back to God and God showed him who the right person to be their king was. Now, we'll learn more about this man next week. This is really just a very short introduction to Saul because our focus today is, is on the people, isn't it? And the way that the people behaved. But they were delighted. They got what they wanted. 
they had chosen to disregard what they got, be discontented, to, um, to demand what they wanted, to then disregard that warning, and they got what they wanted. Excuse me. And so here are some verses to show what happened next. There was a man of Benjamin, a mighty man of power. Benjamin was the, the smallest of the tribes. It was the youngest of the tribes. <coughs> but God chose for the man that became king to be of the tribe of Benjamin. And so this man, there was a man of Benjamin, a mighty man of power. And he had a choice and handsome son whose name was Saul. There was not a more handsome person than he among the children of Israel. From his shoulders upwards, he was taller than any of the people. So in choosing for them the king that they wanted, God gave them what they wanted. Notice that when Saul is first described, he's not talked about as an intelligent man or about someone who cares about others. That doesn't mean he wasn't. But the most important thing here is that he was handsome. So these people who wanted to be like the nations around them would see this man that was to be their king, Saul, was handsome. And so everyone around them, the nations would go, oh, yes, they've got a handsome king. Not a intelligent, thoughtful, caring king, but one who was handsome. That's the first thing we're told about him. Very interesting, isn't it? Now the Lord had told Samuel in his ear the day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow, about this time, I will send you a man from the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him commander over my people Israel that he may save my people from the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked upon my people because their cry has come to me. Saul was traveling with his father and they didn't know which way to go. So they decided to go and see Samuel and ask him which way to go. Saul did not know that he was going to be chosen as king, but he went to Samuel to find out where they needed to go to get home. And the Lord had told Samuel, as we read there, that the right person, the king, would come to him and he would know who that person was. And so that's what happened. Saul came to Samuel to ask for advice and Saul was then anointed. Then Samuel took a flask of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, is it not because the Lord has anointed you commander over his inheritance? The Lord chose Samuel, uh, sorry, chose Saul. And so Samuel anointed him. That means he poured that flask on his head. And this was a symbol that he was the chosen one. You may remember that when we've spoken about David before, that he was anointed also. So Saul was chosen. Saul was to be the first king of Israel. The people had got what they wanted and they were thrilled. Now, clearly, that's not the end of this story. We know that Saul was chosen, that he became king, but we don't know what kind of king he was. That's what we're learning about next week. At this stage, the people are thrilled. They've demanded something from God and he's given it to them. But the problem here is that they didn't demand what was right for them. They demanded something that made them just like everybody else. I don't know about you, but you can hear the foreboding in that, can't you? You can hear that things are not going to go as they expected, as they wanted them to. But right now, the people are happy because they've got what they wanted. We have to think about... What, how that applies to us as well. We have a tendency to be discontented with what we have, wanting more than what we've been given. Maybe we want to be stronger, we want to be healthier, we want to have more money, we want to have a better job, we want to um, 
work really hard at our education so that we can do something more than we thought we'd be able to do. We're constantly striving to have more, maybe more pleasure, maybe more fun. Maybe this whole lockdown has been so tricky for you because it's not what you wanted and it stops you doing what you wanted to do. And that's just like the Israelite people, they were discontented with what they've had. And that discontent led them to make demands on God. It led them to think that they knew better. And so they demanded something from God. And you know, we do that too. I wonder how many times we've thought God really cares about us. He'd take away this pandemic. It's not that simple. He has a purpose for having it in the first place. Perhaps we demand of God that we can do things our own way, that we don't have to follow what he says. We want to do it our own way. We disregard the warnings he gives us. His whole Bible is full of warnings to us about what will happen if we don't listen to him. But we disregard them. And then we're delighted when things appear to go our way. But it's such a short-sighted approach, isn't it? It might be go our way for now, but what about the future? What about an ongoing thought? Our lives don't start and finish here. We will live forever. But where will we live forever? In heaven? Or will we live forever in eternal punishment? The Lord said to Samuel, heed their voice and make them a king. Give them what they wanted. But there's also a warning here for you. Beware, lest you also fall from your own steadfastness, being led away with the error of the wicked. You have a choice to make. Do you let yourself be carried away with what your friends want, with what the people around you think is the best thing, with what you want yourself? Do you let yourself be carried off and then what will happen after that? Perhaps you'll stop coming to Sunday school, you'll stop listening to these messages. You'll gradually stop thinking about what you've been taught. Perhaps you'll grow up thinking that it was all such a waste of time that you didn't need to learn any of this. And you'll just keep drifting and drifting until it's too late. Because when you are dying, you will not be able to suddenly change your, your, your mind and demand that God changes his mind. It doesn't work like that. You have to decide whether you are going to live for him or for you. And you can't do both. If you make demands on God, then you're not listening to what he says. You're not obeying what he says. What does he say? Well, he says that his son came to die for us. He says that we are all sinners. We are full of all things that we do wrong. And it taints our hearts. It stains it with like, it makes it look ugly and horrible to him. And because we are so full of sin, we cannot go to be with him. We cannot be one of his children. We cannot spend eternity with him in heaven, except that we can, because he sent his son so that he could forgive us. He sent his son to take away the punishment, to die on that cross so that all of our sins would be taken far, far away. And he clothes us with the goodness that he has. He makes us fit for him. And all we have to do is ask him, not demand, not say it should all be done our way, but come to him in his way, willing to follow what he says. And he will change us forever. And he will keep us close to him forever. And we will get to live and be with him forever. That won't be a short short term now delight that's a forever delight that's an utter change and i hope that you will consider that 
for yourself. I hope that you will realise the seriousness of what these people did and what that means for us. Help us not to be discontented. Help us to think about what God would have us do. Let's pray together. Dear Lord God, we pray to you and thank you for this example that you give us, Lord. So many times in your word, you give us the examples of the right things that people do. And so many times you give us examples of bad decisions. Lord, help us to use these to, to apply to ourselves, Lord. You've given us the chance to see what will happen to us, to compare ourselves because you don't change. If you treated the Israelites in this way, you will treat us in the same way, Lord with that calm, giving us what we have asked for, and yet it's a short-term pleasure. It's a short-term solution, Lord. Help us to come to you and do what you would have us do, Lord. Help us not to come and demand what we want in our own pleasures, but come to you asking you to have us and to be our Lord and to work in us and change us for your good, Lord. And we pray for these things in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.